Hello everyone. The end of the 12th century. Since we began this history of the Crusades a hundred years earlier, we saw how two main expeditions to the Holy Land, the First and the Second Crusades, and various others of a lesser magnitude, had departed Western Europe to conquer and defend Jerusalem. Jerusalem and other territories, the Crusader states, created in the Levant. We also saw how the concept of Crusade had been broadened to other regions, like in Spain, war against internal enemies. What it reflected and told us about medieval societies and politics, how monastic orders had risen and gained importance, not only in the Holy Land, but all of Christendom. I also told you about the role of Byzantium, the Eastern Roman Empire, in these expeditions that were initially aimed at rescuing it. But quickly, tensions or conflicts appeared with the Crusaders. We also saw what happened on the Muslim side, with the competition between different states or factions, like the Seljuk Turks, the Abbasids or the Fatimids. And finally, we ended episode 2 with the rise of Saladin, the new Sultan of Egypt and Syria who led a victorious campaign against Crusader states, retaking Jerusalem after 90 years of Crusaders' presence. When I left you at the end of part 2, in 1189, the situation of Crusader states in the Near East was very precarious, their worst position since the late 11th century. And I told you that the fall of Jerusalem had triggered a new call to retake the Holy Land. And this time the Crusade, the Third Crusade, was to be led by three kings. Frederick Barbarossa of Germany, the Holy Roman Emperor, Richard I, also known as Richard the Lionheart of England, and Philip II, later known as Philip August of France. Tonight we will relieve their campaign and the numerous events and ulterior crusades that kept happening along the 13th century. We have a lot to explore and you can follow this episode independently, but I recommend you start with part 1 and 2 if you wish to better grasp what I will tell you about. As usual, you have the timestamps in the pinned comment to help you navigate the story if you fall asleep, and in the same comment you will find links to Patreon if you wish to support this channel and get the associated perks, Spotify, Apple Music, or links to free trials to apps on which you can also listen to my stories. Now, adopt a comfortable position. The year is 1189, and the Third Crusade is leaving Western Europe for a clash with the forces of Saladin a clash that had had no equivalent since the First Crusade, almost a century earlier. Of the three royal expeditions that were headed to the Near East, the first to reach it was the one led by Frederick Barbarossa, coming from Germany and the north of Italy in 1190. They had arrived by land, and like for their predecessors, 
This meant that they would need to cross Anatolia, Turkey, on their way to the Holy Land. Anatolia at the time was still disputed between the Byzantines and the Seljuk Turks. The Byzantines were happy to let this army go to the territories of their enemies, and soon fighting with the Turks began. Victoriously at first for the Crusaders, who advanced and would soon reach Antioch. This concerned Saladin, who was still fighting the Crusader states, the remaining forces of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, that kept fighting despite the loss of Jerusalem itself two years earlier, and also the county of Tripoli and the principality of Antioch. Saladin was forced to send troops to the north to block the arrival of the Germans in anticipation. But the confrontation would not happen because an unpredictable event stopped the march forward of the Crusaders' army. Frederick Barbarossa died unexpectedly, crossing a river. The old emperor drowned in circumstances that are unclear, either because he was thrown from his horse while crossing, or he decided to swim and was swept away by the current, or maybe he suffered from hydrocution. There are conflicting testimonies, but in any case, he died, and this beheaded his army. Some of the crusaders decided to return home, and others joined the forces of Philip II and Richard I, that were now also approaching. The two other kings had set sail from South Italy to avoid the longer and dangerous route through Anatolia, with the plan to land directly in the Holy Land, ready for battle. They landed near the city of Acre in Palestine. Acre is now in the north of Israel. The site was an important city. It still exists and it is one of the oldest continuously inhabited settlements in the world because its location was strategic with a natural harbor and a just on the coastal road of Palestine. The remaining forces of the Kingdom of Jerusalem had tried a counter-attack in Acre that they were besieging with their crusaders' allies, including monastic orders like the Knights Templar and the Hospitaliers. But their forces were insufficient to completely surround the city and the city could also receive supplies by the sea, which is why the arrival of the Third Crusade was very good news for the attackers. Philip II was the first to land, a few weeks before Richard, and he joined the siege, starting to construct siege equipment. Six weeks later, Richard arrived, also joined the siege, and another month later, the city fell to Crusaders' hands, the first significant Crusader victory in the Holy Land in years, and a significant setback for Saladin, even though he was not present at the siege. But by the time the siege ended, in July 1191, the motivation of Philip II to go on with the Crusade had already dropped, and he considered leaving to return to France. Why this sudden change after such a long travel, a victory, and only three months in the Holy Land? First, because he was sick. He was weakened by dysentery. He had caught the disease during the siege. Second, because Philip and Richard did not get on well at all. 
they were in a truce for the duration of the crusade, because all their feuds for the control of large lands in western France were not sorted out. I told you about this last time. So they had plenty of reasons to dislike each other. But also on a personal level, Philip disliked that Richard had arrived late at the siege of Acre, that he had done most of the heavy work, and the King of England was now harvesting half the glory, and apparently behaving like the main winner. Maybe they had other petty conflicts, but the bottom line is that they hated each other and Philip went as far as writing to the Pope to complain about the bad manners of Richard. The prospect of spending months, maybe years, campaigning with the other was unbearable, probably for both of them. But apart from disease and disagreements, Philip also had more political and strategic reasons to want to return to France. A strategic reason was that during the siege of Acre, one of Philip's most important vassals, the Count of Flanders, had died. And this death was bad news for Philip. It threatened the balance between his vassals. The succession that was now going to take place in Flanders could possibly let this important county into the hands of the faction led by the Counts of Champagne and threaten his power. So he felt the urge to return quickly to France to settle this succession and eliminate an existential threat for his crown. And finally, he may have had a less honorable but tempting idea. Richard was in the Holy Land, and if he stayed there for a few years, or even better, if he died, that would let his possessions in the north of France undefended, especially the Duchy of Normandy, which was the historical base of the kings of England since William the Conqueror. And uh, indeed, this is what would happen years later. Richard did not die in the Middle East, but Philip would retake by force more than half the possessions of the Plantagenet family on the continent. But for now, Richard the Lionheart remained in command of the entire Crusader force. Philip left an army of 10,000 behind him and uh, another one of his vassals the Duke of Burgundy, with instructions to keep fighting alongside Richard. So the King of England was now the sole commander, and with an army of more than 20,000, he moved south in the direction of Jerusalem, the target of this crusade being to retake the city and re-establish the kingdom of Jerusalem in its frontiers from before 1187, when the city was lost. At first, the campaign was victorious. Acre had fallen in July 1191. Philip of France had left by the end of July. And in September of the same year, the crusaders met an army of Saladin, that was twice bigger than theirs, but they managed to repel them at the Battle of Arsouf. After that, Richard captured the port of Jaffa, another important city that had fallen to Saladin four years earlier, when the Muslims were crushing the Kingdom of Jerusalem, and he kept pushing forward, arriving only 12 miles away of Jerusalem. But the city was not attacked, and he decided to retreat to the coast, because he didn't have the strength to at the same time lay siege around Jerusalem and keep in check other Muslim forces. The following year, 1192, 
was less favorable for the Third Crusade. First, because like in previous Crusades, there was a split. The leader of the French faction of the army, the Duke of Burgundy, who had been left in charge by Philip II, you remember, wanted to directly assault Jerusalem. Richard was in favor of defeating Saladin's forces first, and this split the crusader force into two factions, and none of them was strong enough to achieve its goal. The crusaders were also victims of a phenomenon Saladin was perfectly aware of, attrition. They could not replenish their ranks when they had losses, they were moving in hostile territory most of the time, whereas the Muslims had vast reserves of manpower and equipment. They could just win by staying in the war long enough, provided the Crusaders did not receive reinforcements. In 1192, there was heavy fighting again around Jaffa on the coast of Palestine. The city was taken and retaken, and at this point both sides were willing to end these hostilities. Saladin, because he had other problems to deal with and did not manage to completely eliminate the crusader threat, and Richard, because he understood that taking Jerusalem had become an impossible goal with the remnants of the Third Crusade. And so they entered negotiations to find a way out. An agreement was found, the Treaty of Jaffa. Jerusalem would stay under Muslim control, but Christian pilgrims and traders would be allowed to freely visit the city. Hostilities would end preserving the existence of crusader states and the presence of monastic orders with their fortresses in Christian-controlled territories. So this was a stalemate. The Third Crusade ended without reaching its goal of recapturing the Holy City. So in that sense it was far less successful than the First Crusade, but on the other hand, it probably saved the existence of crusader states by stopping Saladin, and it resolved, for the time being, the problem of pilgrimages to Jerusalem. So, on balance, it was an improvement on the Second Crusade that had failed even before reaching Palestine. This treaty, the Treaty of Jaffa, was between Saladin and Richard I. It reflected the state of things in the Holy Land when it was signed. But it didn't mean Christendom as a whole had signed peace with Saladin. And so it did not put an end to hostilities, it just suspended them. For example, only five years later, in 1197, there was another expedition by Henry VI, the successor to Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, who had died in the Third Crusade. And the following year, in 1198, a new Pope, Innocent III, announced a new crusade called the Fourth Crusade. In the meantime, on the Muslim side, Saladin had died shortly after signing peace with Richard the Lionheart, but his sultanate remained. It is called the Ayyubid dynasty, and in these years it still held Egypt and most of Palestine and Syria. So any expedition to the Levant now implied fighting against the Ayyubids a powerful opponent. This fourth crusade is remembered as the worst from the Christian standpoint. 
it barely reached the Levant, and instead it ended in the dislocation of the Eastern Roman Empire of Byzantium. What happened is that the different leaders and their forces that answered to the call remained disorganized for several years. It only restarted in 1202, more than three years after the Pope's call, and these forces went on separate routes, some coming from Flanders or the south of France, sailed to the Holy Land where they fought, but did not make any difference. The main force gathered in Venice. An agreement had been found for Venice to provide the ships that would transport the crusaders. But Venice was not willing to do it for free. The city wanted to be compensated, and as no one was willing to pay, the Venetians proposed that their city would be paid with the profits of future conquests, beginning with the seizure of Zara, a city in Croatia on the coast of the Adriatic Sea. Zara was a Christian city, and taking it had nothing to do with the goal of the crusade, which was officially, once again, to retake Jerusalem. The capture of Zara only served the expansionist views of Venice. But so it was done, and the crusade was transported to Croatia as mercenaries to fight for Venice in the siege of Zara. This was the price to pay for Venetian ships, and the crusaders had accepted to pay it. In fact, Venice was hijacking the crusade to serve its interests, and at the expense of other Christians, which caused indignation in Christendom. Innocent III condemned this move, but only once the siege had already been laid too late, and he was judged harshly for that. It appears likely that the Pope disapproved, but his desire to salvage the crusade at any cost was stronger. And so after a siege and at least hundreds of dead, Zara was taken by Venice. But the worst was still to come. After that, the Venetians took the army to Constantinople by sea. One of the leaders of the Crusades was the King of Swabia in Germany, Philip of Swabia, and his number one aim in participating in this Crusade was not to go to the Holy Land, but instead to install his brother-in-law on the throne of Byzantium. His brother-in-law, Alexios IV, was the nephew of the reigning emperor, Alexios III, he was a pretender to the crown of Byzantium. The pretender had no fortune or army of his own, but he made big promises to the crusaders if they helped him take the throne in Constantinople. He would provide them with thousands of troops, a fortune, 200,000 marks, and the reunion of the Greek Orthodox Church with the Roman Catholic Church. You remember from the first part of this story that bridging the schism between Rome and the Orthodoxy was one of the factors behind the First Crusade. The First Crusade was also a relief expedition for the Byzantines that had been overwhelmed by the Seljuk Turks. So these promises were attractive, even though the pretender, Alexios, was promising things he didn't have, at least yet. And when the crusade arrived in Constantinople, it was not with the intention to make a quick stop and go on to Palestine through Anatolia but instead to support a coup 
in Byzantium. The reigning emperor, Alexios III, fled the city, and the crusaders installed Alexios IV on the throne. After a few months of chaos, Alexis IV was murdered. He had not been able to deliver on any of his promises to the crusader army, and so the crusaders who were still there, without any supplies or food or ships because the Venetians had gone, they decided to take by force what had been promised to them. Constantinople was sacked for three days, including the pillaging of churches and the killing of thousands of Greek inhabitants. Again, when news that this had happened reached the West and even the Muslim world, there was widespread condemnation. Constantinople was seen by all as a beacon of antique culture and civilization, which it was. And the way the crusade had derailed to turn into the looting of a Christian city was seen as unacceptable. The losers of this episode were first of all Byzantium. It broke apart into several states, some loyal to the Eastern Roman Empire heritage, like the Nicene Kingdom in Anatolia, and others called Latin states in Greece, where European Catholic lords carved new states for themselves, like the crusaders of the First Crusade had done in the Levant more than a century before. It was not the end of the story for Byzantium, not yet, because later the kingdom of Nicaea got back Constantinople and recreated, reproclaimed the Byzantine state, but only as the shadow of what it once was. The Fourth Crusade can also be considered a losing party here, because this is how it ended, without really intervening in the Levant, except for the troops that had taken a different route and sailed straight instead of negotiating with Venice. Despite the blow to its reputation, Venice was actually a beneficiary of this crusade because the downfall of Byzantium helped it become a great maritime power in the east of the Mediterranean Sea. Apart from Zara, it could create a small empire on islands and with trading posts that contributed to its fortune. The derailing of the Fourth Crusade is an extreme example, but not the only time when exactions unrelated to the military or religious purpose of Crusades happened. In the previous part, I told you how the concept of Crusade had been broadened to turn against internal enemies considered heretical, but a population that was also targeted repeatedly was the Jews. It happened in the Middle East when armies crossed Syria and Palestine, but on a larger scale also across Europe. Medieval antisemitism did not appear with the Crusades. There are records of attacks by mobs and spoliations in previous centuries, but it certainly intensified. Probably as a result of the feats of fervor that the course to crusades generated. In many regions, Jewish communities were the most visible non-Christian minority, often the only one. And for mobs, attacking them was a way of doing something to satisfy their violent impulse against non-Christians. Most of the time, Attacks and massacres were not decided by authorities. They were spontaneous and uncontrollable. I told you in part one about the massacres that took place in the Rhine region as the People's Crusade. You remember this expedition of peasants and lesser nobles that also traveled eastward at the time of the First Crusade. 
that these episodes multiplied. They were intense in France during the Second and Third Crusades, and they often happened near the trails of crusader armies, or in countries that provided a lot of crusaders. Authorities actually often tried to calm things down, especially the successive popes or locally the bishops, but they feared the mobs and there was clearly a tolerance to it, because only exceptionally did the perpetrators face legal punishment. So in Jewish memory, the Crusades and their bursts of violence are remembered as particularly dark times. There are many signs that anti-Semitism rose in Europe in those years. They left deep scars and they made thousands and thousands of victims. In some cases, anti-Semitic policies were implemented by authorities too. For example, Philip August, who participated in the Third Crusade, is also remembered for the mistreatment of Jews in France. Or Innocent III, the Pope who called to the Fourth Crusade that we just talked about, also passed anti-Jewish legislation. Now, if we return to the Levant, because we still have almost a century to cover, the situation in 1204, when the Fourth Crusade ended, was unchanged. Since the main outcomes of the Fourth Crusade had been the explosion of Byzantium and the sack of Constantinople, so overall, the Fourth Crusade ended up essentially pitting Christians against other Christians. More than ten years passed, during which the enthusiasm for another expedition was limited. In Western Europe, Philip August of France was aggressively expanding, especially at the expense of the Plantagenet, the English kings and a coalition formed against him that included England and the Holy Roman Empire. He came out of it victorious, but obviously this long and costly war meant that several of the largest states in Christendom were not in a position to launch any faraway expedition. So, in the Holy Land, the situation remained roughly the same, Jerusalem was firmly in the hands of the sultans of Egypt. At the time, the sultan was Aladil, Saladin's brother, who had inherited the throne after his brother's death. The pope, Innocent III, had not taken the initiative of a new crusade since the failure of the Fourth Crusade in 1204. And finally, in 1217, 13 years later, he called for a new campaign, also aimed at Jerusalem, but this time with a different plan. First, the crusaders were to conquer Egypt, the main base of the Ayyubids, Saladin's successors. And from there, they would move to Palestine. This was the fifth crusade. And we can go relatively fast on it, because as we're going to see, it did not really achieve anything. Its main leaders were the King of Hungary and the Duke of Austria. They were joined by uh, the Count of Holland and a mixed army of Dutch, Flemish and Frisian soldiers. There were also the Templars, the uh, Hospitaliers, and a new rising order, the Teutonic Knights, that sent troops to support this expedition. They started a siege around the port of Damietta, on the coast of Egypt, and successfully, because the city fell in 1219. At the time, there was a new Ayyubid Sultan, al kamil and he was in a civil war fighting with his brothers and other factions for the control 
of the Sultanate. So he was willing to make peace as quickly as possible, and he offered surprisingly attractive peace terms that included the return of Jerusalem to Christian rule with free access for Muslim pilgrims. But the Pope's representative, the legate, who led the crusade, rejected the terms and took the offer as a sign of weakness that had to be exploited. So, from Damietta, the crusaders marched south toward Cairo, Egypt's main city, in 1221. But instead of the expected victorious march, this offensive turned to a nightmare. On the way, the crusaders attacked a stronghold at the Battle of Mansoura. They lost, and they were forced to surrender. This time, obviously, the terms on offer would not be that attractive. To save their lives, they had to accept the surrender of Damietta. They also had to accept to leave Egypt altogether. And obviously, Jerusalem was now off the table. And this is how the Fifth Crusade ended in failure in 1221, having accomplished nothing. Now, as I just mentioned, the situation of the Ayyubid Sultans, the rulers of Egypt and Syria, was complicated in the years around 1221. There were internal feuds that left them in a situation of weakness, and the peace offers of Sultan Al-Kamil to the Fifth Crusade, after they had taken only one city, Damietta, was already a sign of this. But it got worse in the following years. And this left the Ayyubids in a situation of extreme weakness in front of any other enemies. In Europe, Philip August had aged and was now approaching the end of his reign. In the Holy Roman Empire, the emperor had changed and was now Frederick II. Frederick II had promised to participate in the Fifth Crusade, the one of the years 1217 to 1221, but he had done nothing. And ten years later, he still hadn't honored his promise to go to war. He finally decided to move in 1228, seven years after the failure of the Fifth Crusade. And his expedition is called the Sixth Crusade, or sometimes the Crusade of Frederick II. This expedition involved very little actual fighting. Both sides were more willing to compromise, and so diplomatic negotiations had already begun, even before the expedition reached the Levant. In fact, other crusades that did not receive a number actually saw much more fighting than this one. But it is called the Sixth Crusade because it was led by a king. Frederick II was Holy Roman Emperor and also King of Sicily. And importantly, because it achieved results, a diplomatic victory. The Ayyubids were in such a state of weakness that they accepted to give back not only ports like Sidon and Jaffa, but also Jerusalem itself. The Sultan Al-Kamil was fighting his brothers in this civil war, and just could not afford to fight on another front. So he had to sign peace, whatever the cost. What the Second to Fifth Crusades had failed to achieve with large battles and tens of thousands of troops, the Sixth Crusade achieved by diplomacy. Armed diplomacy, but still, this crusade did not see any large engagement. 
the kingdom of Jerusalem had lost almost everything in the counter-attacks of Saladin in the years 1180. But 40 years later, it still had not disappeared. It had a king and a tiny territory south of the county of Tripoli. It was also under the protection of monastic orders that had helped keep it alive. So, after the diplomatic agreement that ended the Sixth Crusade, it expanded again to a strip of land that went from Beirut in modern Lebanon almost to Ascalon to the south. And inland, it now included Jerusalem again, that was returned to Christian hands 42 years after its conquest by Saladin. So, even though the Sixth Crusade had uh, nothing spectacular, it was actually the most successful one since the first. It ended in a peace agreement, more exactly a truce agreement, for ten years, and it included significant gains, like Jerusalem. Frederick had not forgotten himself, he became the new king of Jerusalem by marrying the previous king's daughter. On the Muslim side, only Sultan al-Kamil was pleased with the result, because in the rest of the Arab world, the loss of Jerusalem with so little resistance was considered dishonorable. On the Christian side, it was generally considered a success, but one that annoyed the Pope. Even before, and it went on during the Crusade, Frederick II and the Pope were in open conflict, to the point that before sailing to the Levant and achieved his Crusade, Frederick had been excommunicated by the Pope. But despite this excommunication, he had been successful and recovered Jerusalem. This made the Pope look powerless and on the wrong side of history, or worse, not in God's favors. So he wasn't pleased with this success. And finally, a year after the crusade, he had to lift the excommunication. It is another story, but the rivalry between Frederick II and the papacy did not end there. It turned to a long conflict in which the popes ultimately prevailed. But before that, Frederick was excommunicated three times, and there was even a call to a crusade against him. But returning to our topic, this revival of crusader states after the Sixth Crusade with the first significant expansion of the Kingdom of Jerusalem in 40 years, this kept the flame alive across Christendom. Several years passed. There was this truce signed with the Sultan. But new expedition projects appeared in the years 1230, especially this time in England and France. The Anglo-French War was mostly over at this point. Philip August had died in 1223, leaving France larger than ever, mostly at the expense of the Plantagenet, who only had Aquitaine left in the southwest of France. Hostilities between the two kingdoms were on hold, and the nobility on both sides was now in a position to look overseas. And so in the years 1239 to 1241, there was a series of crusades, especially one from France led by the Count of Champagne and the Duke of Burgundy, and one from England led by the Earl of Cornwall. These expeditions are called the Barons' Crusade, and they were successful at re-expanding the Kingdom of Jerusalem a little bit to the south and inland to the east. 
so that by 1241, the situation for the Crusaders looked better than it had since the rise of Saladin. They hadn't returned to the frontiers of 1099 after the First Crusade, they never would. But they had got back not only Jerusalem, but also several strongholds and cities that gave them a bit of strategic depth. However, this positive feeling was not going to last very long. Because far to the east, a shockwave had reached the Middle East, and its repercussions were about to reach them. The Mongol invasion. In the previous parts, I told you about the Abbasids, the caliphate and state that controlled much of Mesopotamia at the time of the Crusades from their capital in Baghdad and was of particular importance, relevance, in the Muslim world because the caliphs were seen as the heads of the Ummah, the community of the faithful. Now, east of the Abbasids, in Persia and Central Asia, another Muslim empire had risen along the 12th century, the Khwarazmian Empire, which originally were vassals of the Seljuk Turks, but they had taken their independence and expanded dramatically, merging Turkic and Persian cultures. In the 13th century, the Mongol invasion coming from the steppes of Asia had arrived, and the Khwarazmian Empire was one of its numerous victims. It was overwhelmed and destroyed in 1231, shortly after the Sixth Crusade had secured the return of Jerusalem to the Christians. As a state, the Khwarazmian Empire no longer existed but some of its armies had escaped, they had survived, and one of them, which was 10,000 cavalry strong, had reached the Levant. It had no state left, no allegiance, but the Khwarazmian riders had stayed together. They were ready to work as mercenaries or live on the land and the Ayyubid Sultan quickly saw the advantage of hiring them. If he did, he would have a new army to repel the crusaders that had begun to expand again during the Barons' Crusade. And if he didn't, the Khwarazmians would probably loot his lands. So an alliance was made between the Sultan and this army to attack Jerusalem with forces that far exceeded the city's defenses in 1244, three years after the last of the barons' expeditions. In July 1244, the Khwarazmian army surrounded Jerusalem with the blessing of the Sultan, and after a quick siege, the city fell, leading to a new sack and massacre. For the second time, and after 15 years since the Sixth Crusade, Jerusalem was lost by the Christians and retaken by the Muslims, but in a terrible state because the sack left large parts of it in ruin. An allied army of Crusaders was hastily raised and met the combined forces of the Ayyubids and their Khwarazmian ally three months later at the Battle of La Forbie, northeast of Gaza. The Crusaders were outnumbered, their enemies were twice as many, and this time there would be no miracle. The Crusaders lost, and the balance of power shifted again. Jerusalem was lost, Christian power and presence in the Holy Land had collapsed, and the situation was now very complicated again for the Kingdom of Jerusalem. The loss of the Holy City 
and the spectacular setback for the Christians encouraged a new reaction in Europe once again. And this time it came from France. The new crusade, the seventh, would soon depart and its leader would be Louis IX of France, also known as Saint Louis. In the years 1240, calls to crusades by the Pope multiplied. The Pope was now Innocent IV, and he preached at the same time a crusade to the Holy Land, the one that Louis IX would lead, against the old Prussians, pagans who lived east of Poland. This one was led by the Teutonic Knights, also against Mongol incursions to the east of Europe, and finally an internal one against Frederick II, this conflict I mentioned earlier. But let's focus on the one to the Middle East, the Seventh Crusade. Like for the Fifth, the plan was to attack Egypt first. For some time now, the Christians had identified Egypt as the main seat of Muslim power in the Near East. And with good reason. Syria and Palestine had been unstable since the First Crusade and even before. There were constant wars, they changed hands often. And these regions were not as wealthy or as populated as Egypt. In contrast, Egypt had a large population, several million. It remained the breadbasket that it had been since the early antiquity, and it provided the Ayyubids, like the Fatimids before, with considerable resources, manpower, food, equipment, income. So, landing directly in the Holy Land or in Syria was a guarantee that a counter-attack would come, probably from Egypt. And it didn't really attack the power base of the Ayyubid sultans. Louis IX, Saint Louis, had ascended to the throne early, aged 12. And he had a long and even full reign that lasted 44 years, until 1270. His involvement in the Seventh Crusade began in 1244, when he was 30. Still in France, he was stricken with malaria, to the point that his life appeared in danger. And on what could have become his deathbed? He vowed that if he recovered, he would set out for a crusade, and he did recover the following year. So he took the cross as promised and started to make preparations. These preparations took three years. One reason was that he was still too weak to travel, and then that enthusiasm for crusades had decreased markedly. Yes, Jerusalem had been lost again in 1244, but we were now 150 years almost after the start of the First Crusade, and it was not the first time Jerusalem was lost. Crusader states in the Levant didn't seem to make any sustainable progress after all these decades. Actually, they were again at a low point. And so, even though it was not acceptable to publicly say that crusades were in vain, this idea was circulating in the high nobility. There was some crusade fatigue in France and in general in Europe. So, finding lords who would come along with their troops was not easy. Finally, the Counts of Provence and Artois, and a bit later the Duke of Burgundy and an English detachment joined. Luckily for him, Louis IX had large human and financial resources. 
The 13th century was a period of ongoing prosperity for the Kingdom of France. It had been expanded by Philip August at the beginning of the century, and the development of cities or the expansion of cultivable land that I told you about in the previous part went on. This prosperity was reflected in architecture. This is the century when large Gothic cathedrals were constructed, including Notre Dame de Paris. Large fortunes were amassed. I told you about the Knights Templar in the previous part. This was a century of immense prosperity for them. But there were also traders, abbeys, fiefdoms that prospered in their economic activity, agriculture, the taxes they collected, or donations they received. It was not all perfect. It was also a period of conflicts with peasant revolts. Occasionally, food went missing. Remote places or cities were very unsafe. But relatively to previous centuries, there was economic progress and demographic expansion. The army that accompanied Louis IX was 20,000 to 30,000 strong. A big effort for France alone, given that most participants came from this country. But this is far from the numbers of the First Crusade, about three times less to put things in perspective. On the positive side, Louis paid for almost everything by collecting extraordinary temporary taxes or confiscating properties. Jewish moneylenders were spoliated and expelled, for example. Another example of anti-Jewish policies during the Crusades. The fact that he paid gave him unprecedented control over his army. He was the only one in command of the bulk of the Crusade, and there was no risk of splits and disagreements like in previous expeditions. So in 1248, he sailed with the army from the south of France to Cyprus, a good base near the Levant. And at the time, Cyprus was under crusader control. Decades earlier, in the Third Crusade, the army of Richard the Lionheart had occupied the island, and Richard had sold it to the Knights Templar. Soon after that, the Lusignan family, who were also kings of Jerusalem, occupied the island and created a kingdom on it, a separate kingdom, the Kingdom of Cyprus. The population was mainly Greek, but the island was ruled by a minority of Roman Catholics who lived in cities. So it was a friendly base for the Seventh Crusade and the plan to attack Egypt rather than land directly in Palestine was finalized there. The following steps in this campaign looked a lot like the Fifth Crusade, including the disaster at the end. The army arrived by the sea and besieged Damietta, this port on the Egyptian coast, with success. Damietta was taken. The Sultan was now As Sali, the son of the previous Sultan during the Fifth Crusade, the one who had offered to trade Damietta for Jerusalem. And like his father before him, he offered the same deal give us back Damietta, and we will give you Jerusalem and a truce. The offer was less attractive than during the Fifth Crusade because at this point, Jerusalem was still in ruins and hard to defend. But in any case, like in the Fifth Crusade, the offer was rejected, and Louis IX advanced towards Cairo. This implied fighting the Ayyubids again, at Mansoura, 
the place where the fifth crusade had been destroyed. But this time, after six weeks of intermittent fighting, the crusaders were victorious. A victory that was only temporary. Because a few weeks later, as Louis IX was looking at how to keep advancing and how to take Cairo, another battle took place, the Battle of Fariscour, and it was a disastrous defeat for the crusade. So disastrous that Louis was made prisoner. The king was a very valuable prisoner, and the Ayyubids used him and other captured lords as bargaining chips to recover Damietta and receive a large ransom. A ransom that the Knights Templar agreed to pay, they had the means, and this was how Louis IX was released from captivity. In 1250, two years after departure, the crusade had failed, it had achieved nothing and cost a fortune. But Louis didn't leave immediately. He stayed four more years in Acre to reorganize the defense of Crusader states and also because all hope had not been lost. The news of his capture had reached France. There was no money or motivated lords left to send a rescue expedition. And other European kings were certainly in no hurry to help him. The King of England, Henry III, had also taken the cross in 1250. But he convinced the Pope to postpone any expedition because he didn't mind having the King of France far away and in trouble. There was also nothing to hope from the Holy Roman Empire, which was at war with the Pope. You remember there was this internal crusade called by the Pope against Frederick II. Frederick II, who died that same year, in 1250. But his son, the new emperor, inherited this war. So, no official help for Saint Louis. But in the wider population, the flame of the Crusades still existed. To the surprise of authorities, a new popular crusade arose in northern France and the Low Countries something similar to the People's Crusade that had taken place during the First Crusade. And its objectives were the liberation of Louis and uh, reclaiming the Holy Land. The movement spread rapidly and an army of nearly 60,000 men was formed. Many of them were shepherds, which is why this movement was called the Shepherd's Crusade. But this one did not go very far. Instead of marching to the Levant, it began pillaging and attacking church properties in the north of France. It was uncontrollable, and it ended up dividing itself into several armies which spread terror across France. All these armies of looters were reduced or scattered at great cost, and this is how the Shepherd's Crusade ended in 1251. Finally, there would be no relief for the Seventh Crusade. And in 1254, four years after his liberation from captivity, Louis returned to France. On balance, the Seventh Crusade was a disaster, militarily, humanly and financially. Times were really changing in the Levant now. The Mongol invasion in the Middle East now threatened to overwhelm everything. The Ayyubid dynasty in Egypt, the successors of Saladin, who had been weakened for some time now by internal feuds, finally collapsed and it was replaced by new rulers, the Mamluks, and the Crusader states were on the defensive, losing ground. During the following decade, 
they were reduced to a few coastal outposts. No new expedition would reach the Holy Land. Louis IX wanted to take a revenge, but never returned. He tried an expedition called the Eighth Crusade, but targeting Tunisia, far to the west from Palestine. And this is where he died, in 1270, at the siege of Tunis. Between 1272 and 1302, many crusades to free the Holy Land were proposed, but none actually materialized. The city of Tripoli was lost in 1289, after almost two centuries of Western European presence, Acre in 1291, and the last crusader bastion in the Levant, Ruad, fell in 1302. A few years later, the Knights Hospitaliers found refuge on the island of Rhodes that they conquered from Byzantium. The Knights Templar would soon after be disbanded. For a time, the Mongols became the new masters of the Middle East. They converted to Islam, but as a fighting force, they disintegrated. In Egypt, the Mamluks would continue for another century. But the Crusader states were gone for good, and the Crusades to liberate Jerusalem and the Holy Land were now over. So that's for the Middle East. But as we have discussed in previous parts, the legacy of the Crusades went well beyond this region. I told you about other crusades in Europe, not necessarily against Muslims, and how society, the mindset of Christian Europeans, were affected by this movement that had begun two centuries earlier. There were other impacts, for example on art and architecture. With such a long occupation, and abundant travel between the Levant and Western Europe. The Crusades favored a synthesis of European, Byzantine and Muslim traditions. It can be seen in the military architecture of the Crusader states, fortresses and castles that influenced European castles for the rest of the Middle Ages with innovations or techniques taken from Byzantium and the Arabs or the Turks. This also influenced monumental architecture. Until the 11th century, European architecture was dominated by the Romanesque style, quite massive with very thick walls and few windows. The Byzantines and the Arabs had somewhat more audacious styles of building, with thinner walls and columns, using their engineering and experience to build higher and in a more ornate style. This influenced the nascent Gothic architecture. There were other influences too, of course, but some of the techniques of the Gothic style were the product of this synthesis or influence that started in the Levant. Manuscripts were produced over several decades in Crusader states, in Cyprus, or by European travelers who visited Byzantium, and this also ensured a transmission of some aspects of the cultures they were in contact with. Despite the end and the the failure of the Crusades to secure Jerusalem and the Holy Land, the volume of goods traded between Europe and the Middle East kept growing. Merchants ventured further to the East, and this also shaped the economy of the Middle East. Cities that were far away from the Crusades, like Baghdad or cities along the Silk Road, indirectly benefited from increased relevance in trade. And for better or worse, there is a legacy of national mythologies or tales of heroism 
on both sides, Christian and Muslim. Figures like Saladin, Richard the Lionheart, Godfrey of Bouillon of the First Crusade, Frederick II, owe part of their aura as historical figures to their involvement in these wars. The term crusade keeps being used, sometimes by supporters of a political Islam who encourage the idea of a centuries-long struggle against Christians. And a similar position exists in some Christian circles. So even though the last crusade, the last religiously motivated expedition to the Middle East, happened more than 700 years ago, the term crusade remains loaded with plenty of different possible meanings, from religious war to manifestations of imperialism, or in common language in a much more trivial sense, to qualify any struggle for a cause, like crusade for the environment or to popularize something. But we have reached the end of our overview. I hope you liked this introduction to the history of the Crusades, and I'll be back soon with another story for you. Sleep well. Sweet dreams. Au revoir.